Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're here. Lord, I thank you for your presence. I thank you that you've already gone before us and that this date is already circled on the calendar of heaven for an encounter. And Lord, that's not just hype. Those aren't just hopeful words. I believe it's a mandate for tonight. Lord, I just speak to every distraction in the room and I say, get out. I speak to weariness and tiredness and I say, get out because Holy Spirit, you were not weary and you were not tired. So God, I thank you that we get beyond ourselves. We tap into you and your presence. Lord, we thank you that we are not driven by our emotions, but we are driven by your presence. And so God, I call forth a renewing of the mind tonight. I call forth blind eyes to see, deaf ears to hear, hard hearts to be softened. Lord, I believe you have already begun to prepare the soil and prepare the ground for what you want to lay and build tonight because tonight is about women getting set free. Tonight is about daughters walking into their destiny. Tonight is about transformation. Tonight is about assignments. Tonight is about releasing daughters into their fullness and anything that would would attempt and the key word is attempt to sabotage what you have intended for tonight I thank you Lord that by the blood of Jesus what you want to get done tonight will get done tonight because Lord your word does not return void we declare into the atmosphere we declare into the ground that God I thank you that what you want done will happen I thank you God for daughters that are going to be different walking out than how they walked in in Jesus' name, amen. In 2017, at the beginning of it, and I'm not someone that often asks, what's the significance of this year? I know a lot of people do that, especially those that would move in the prophetic. That's one of my gifts as well. But I haven't tended to do that for whatever reason. But this year was different. And I said, God, what are you saying for this year? And I heard the Lord begin to say a very key statement. And I didn't have full revelation of it, but I knew there was a weight in the spirit with it. And he said, Krista, this is the year of breaking cycles. This is the year of my children getting totally and completely set free. This isn't a year of partial freedom. This is the year of total freedom. This is the year of where cycles that have been of sabotage, that have been broken parts of our personality, that we have identified as who we are, are actually going to be exposed and seen for what they are, and they're going to have a transaction in the spirit, and the broken parts are going to be handed to the Father, and the whole parts are going to be imparted into us daughters. And the Lord told me that the number 17, and if you research this, of course, you will find this out as well, the number 17 biblically means overcoming and defeating the enemy overcoming and defeating the enemy is the number 17. It also means total and complete victory. Not partial victory, friends. Total victory. And he began to talk to me and show me, and again, it's not to call people out, it's not even to come from a critical position at all, but the Lord will take you through a process when he's beginning to open up your eyes and your spirits to a situation. And we saw in our last presidential campaign, brace yourselves, don't worry, I'm not going political at all. Trust me. It's the last, that's just, it's not where I'm going. But we saw in a political campaign, we saw division happen in this nation like never before. We saw people's social media accounts be filled with rants and opinions that were incredibly divisive, hateful, ugly. We've seen racism have a resurgence. It's been in the underbelly. It's coming up once again. It's the same demons we've been dealing with for decades, and that demon hasn't been defeated. But let me tell you, it's going to be defeated. But we are seeing, we are seeing a divisiveness, not only in our nation, but we're also seeing it in the church. And again, I emphasize this isn't it was a critical heart. I wasn't sitting there, you know, wrongfully judging people or, or looking sideways at people. But I was observing behavior and responses 
And I began to hear the Lord say, there has to be a difference between my children and the world. There must be a chasm. There has to be a contrast between how the world responds and how my sons and daughters respond. And he says, right now, there's not a contrast. Everyone looks the same. So ladies, I'm here tonight because you and I are called to be the contrast. You and I are called to look different, to sound different, to respond different. But that requires you and I to get really up close and personal. That's going to require you to trust me tonight. And it might be difficult for you to trust me because you don't know me. But can you allow me to play any role you will allow me to play in your life so that you will trust me? Can I be a pastor in your life? Can I be a friend? Maybe a sister? Can I just be a woman? Can I ask for your grace to be extended for me tonight? And for you to open your hearts to receive what could possibly be a challenging word to hear, but be assured I'm preaching to myself too. Because I haven't arrived. I'm absolutely preaching myself through the same process and same invitation from the Lord. But ladies, if there's a contrast that the Lord wants to have in our lives, then we have to get honest about the cycles and the behaviors, the mindsets, the strongholds, and the lies that we've been believing in our lives and that we've allowed to be active in our lives. Because for too long, we have been casual about strongholds, lies, and ungodly behavior being our normal. And God is saying, come on church, where's my holiness again? Where's my righteousness? Where's my truth speakers? Where's those that are going to stand for morality? Where are those that are going to stand in love and declare truth in love? Where are those? But see, we have to get beyond ourselves in order to be full of him. Because if you're full of yourself, you can't be full of him. And so tonight we're going to unpack ourselves so that we can get full of Jesus because the church has taken that consumerism mentality that the church, that the world offers up hook, line and sinker that it's all about us. Honey, it ain't about you. It's all about him. And we've been preaching a message that it's all about us. Oh, it's not even close to about us. It is all about the beautiful savior, Jesus. It is all about what he did on that cross. It is all about the sacrifice and shed blood. That in his grace and in his mercy, we are found righteous before him. Oh, friends, we have flipped the script in the church. And we are preaching on the Facebook platform of life a deluded gospel that God wants to make pure again. And he's saying, where are my salt and where is my light? That's you and I. Can I tell you a story? Years ago, I was dealing with a physical condition in my body. There was no medical cure. It wasn't life-threatening, but it did have symptoms that were quite aggravating. Anyone relate to that? And I was told that I would just have to deal with it. And I would just have to figure out a way to manage it. And there was, in a great way, a resolve in me that just went, nah. Nope. I am not going to put up with this for the rest of my life. I had to eat a really restricted diet. It was just confining, and it felt like it owned me. It felt like it was managing me versus me taking authority of the situation. So the Lord, in my quiet time, I just went to him, and I petitioned, and I said, Jesus, I know this isn't your highest or your best. I know that you are a healer. And I want to see the healer be manifested in my body. Jesus, come and heal my body. And I got the most interesting response. 
He said, I'm going to heal your body, but I'm going to do so much more than that. And I didn't know what he meant, and he didn't explain. But he says, will you trust me in what I'm about to ask you? And I said, I'll trust you. And he says, I want you to go to every single altar call and any opportunity there is for prayer, I want you to respond to that. I thought, sure, no problem, I can do that. Well, what I had not considered when I so quickly agreed to that was at the time I was living abroad and I was a student at a church in a program that had five services a weekend (laughs) that I was required to be at as a student. And every one of them had one, if not two, times of altar ministry, sometimes during the worship, sometimes at the end, sometimes one, sometimes both. And the Lord reminded me as soon as I got there, and the reality of my agreement set in. And I remember sitting kind of way far back, and it felt like a really long walk to the altar. But I remember thinking, I want to be healed more than I want to please man. And that became the decision almost every time. And week after week after week, I went up to every single altar call, every single response for things that had nothing to do with me, things that were men only, things that were addictions, things I didn't even quite know what they were talking about. But I was just so desperate for my healing. And I remember month one went by, and month two went by, and month three, four, and I'm going up minimum five times every service, and it starts to get awkward. And the people at the altar that had been praying with me and at first were like, oh, come, come, pray, come, come, are now like this. <laughs> they don't even want to make eye contact with me. They feel weird. I feel weird. We all feel weird. Because I'm not getting healed, but I keep going back. And sometimes our persistence, ladies, can be an irritant to people. Sometimes our persistence can be frustrating. It can be unexplainable. Why does she keep going? Because it came to the point where my friends and their most pure motive, they were like, you can just stay here, Krista. We'll pray for you in the seat. And I remember in that moment, I felt like the Lord goes, you choose. You choose. And at that point, I had clued in enough, maybe not fully, but clued in enough to know this was way bigger than physical healing. Oh, no, no, this was going after ego. This was going after reputation. This was going after man-pleasing. This was going after being misunderstood. This was going after being uncomfortable and making people uncomfortable and being okay with being uncomfortable. This wasn't just about a physical thing. It became so much bigger than that. And every time I walked forward, it was like week in and week out, month after month after month. And I was like, okay, I got to, oh, and then I broke my ankle in the middle of it. So I had a sweet brace. (laughs) Right? Awesome. So my walk was even a little slower. He uses it all. I want you to know, ladies, that on the 12th month and why, God, it took that long, he healed me. He healed me. And I've never had a symptom since. Never had an issue since, but I want you to know that it took 12 months to uproot that man-pleasing thing within me. It took 12 months to decimate my ego and lay down my reputation. It took me 12 months to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. It took 12 months to stop caring about what anyone thought in my pursuit of Jesus. It took 12 months.
That's how deep that thing was. I wish it had taken one month. I wish it had only taken two months. But ladies, I had to get honest that that thing was so ingrained in me. It took 12 months, five days a week, so to speak, five services a week, I should say, to get that thing out of me. And even if it tries to come, I'm so familiar with it now. I can smell that thing 10 miles away. And then that just makes you want to one-two the enemy. Because when you've walked through deliverance and you've experienced freedom, you know there's no way you're going back to bondage once you've walked in freedom. But here's the thing, and this is what I'm coming to you tonight with. Some of us in this room, you're going to start that 12-month altar moment tonight. And it's going to be painful. And it won't be easy. But there is deliverance on the horizon for you. And some of it tonight is going to be instantaneous. And some of it's going to be a process. But I assure you, ladies, if you stay the course of what God wants to uproot in your life. Because, ladies, this is about destiny. This is about identity. This is about you walking out your fullness and who you are. Because we have an assignment in this time in history. The world needs us daughters to rise up. But, in, but they need us. They need us healed. They need us healthy. And they need us whole. They don't need us preaching a deluded gospel that is rooted in poor theology, learned behavior that's rooted in disappointment and disillusionment. They need us women of God declaring the truth, knowing who we are, not determined by what we see, but what the Spirit of God says. But you can only get that perspective when you get out of yourself and you get out of your dysfunction. Ladies, we've got to get healthy. Because for too long we've allowed mom's issue to be our issue. We've allowed mom's issue to be our issue. Our daughters have our issue. And we're passing on the wrong legacy. But tonight God's like, I want to redeem the legacy of my daughters. And that's going to happen when you grab a hold of God being God. Because he told me that he is a transforming God, ladies. And we've got to just start allowing God to be who he is. To be the king of kings. The great I am. The deliverer. The redeemer. The restorer. The refuge. Your strong tower. The great I am. The Jesus that gives it all. Your transformer. Come on. I mean, we've got to allow God to be the healer. Your Jehovah Jireh, your provider. He is your truth. He is your strength. He is shalom. He is your peace. Come on, that's right. We have access to the King of Kings every single day of our lives. And yet we are walking around full of bondage and contradiction when we have transformation at our fingertips in the word of God and the spirit of God within us. Ladies, what are we doing? If we are not grabbing a hold of what is available to us every day, why are we settling for a subpar version of this walk with Jesus when we have the full version available to us every day? Because it is time for us to not waste one more day with that depression, with that self-sabotage, with that comparison, with that insecurity, with those self-worth issues. We don't have time for that anymore. Anybody, nobody got time for that. We don't have time for it. We have way too many more important things to do for the kingdom of God than start focusing on ourselves and start focusing on what God wants to do through you. If 
you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Exodus 3. There's a man by the name of Moses. You know him well. You've probably heard a lot of sermons about him. But I want to hopefully shed a little bit, di little bit different view of him tonight. I'm going to kind of recap because we're going to jump in at Exodus 3 in kind of the middle part of his life. So I want you to understand his backdrop because when you understand someone's history, you understand often why they make the decisions they make. See, Moses was born in a very interesting time of history. He was actually born in the middle of a genocide. He was born where the Hebrew boys were not wanted. For the sake of saving his life, his parents had to make the, one of the most difficult decisions. They had to literally put him in a basket, put him down the river, and hope he would be spared. Can you imagine? And in that hope of him being spared, the king's daughter's bathing. Many of you know this story, but for those that don't, I want to make sure you understand what we're walking into. She's bathing, she sees a basket, she goes over and she sees, oh my goodness, it's a baby boy. It must be one of those Hebrew babies. She has compassion and mercy and she decides, I'm going to raise this child as my own. So Moses, being Hebrew of blood, gets raised in Pharaoh's courts and is Egyptian by culture. Now this is important. You have to understand that he had a paradox and a contradiction he was born into. His people that he was of by blood were in slavery. And yet his family and people he called mom, dad, grandpa, whatnot, those were the captors. He was torn between two cultures, two identities. I'm Hebrew by blood, but I'm Egyptian by culture. Who am I? What am I all about? And what looked like a contradiction, because he didn't understand, he had this justice, God-given justice within him, but it was immature. It wasn't refined yet. It wasn't developed. It wasn't discipled. And in him not understanding his destiny, him certainly not understanding who he was or what he carried, he saw an injustice happening between a Hebrew slave and an Egyptian guard, and he goes to intervene because he has the justice thing in him. That's the God-given part of him. And he goes in and he gets in a verbal argument that turns into a physical altercation, and he ends up killing the Egyptian guard. See, when we use our gift and it's in its immature state, it can cause a lot of messes. When you use your gift in an immature state, it can cause a lot of messes. Ladies, it's key. It, there is God-given mandates and talents and gifts in you, but they have to be honed in by the Spirit of God. There has to be a maturity and a development with what all of us carry. And him not understanding, he creates this mess. And in the mess, he runs for his life because he knows they, could, they want to kill him. And so he goes, life goes on, the years pass by, and he creates a completely different life. He gets married. His, he's working for his father-in-law, Jethro, and he's in the back of the desert. He's minding his own business. He has sidelined himself because he, he's failed. Sound familiar? That might apply to some ladies tonight. You've sign-lined yourself because you feel like you've made bad decisions. And you're in the back of the desert. You think you're hidden. And you think there's no way I'm going to do anything beyond the sheep. This is about as good as it gets. And right when you think it's just another day being a shepherd and then God shows up. Because see, that young boy that was spared that was Hebrew by blood and Egyptian by culture was the perfect recipe for the deliverer of the children of Israel because he was the only Hebrew that knew the ways of the royal court and had enough favor to go before the king 
to actually have enough favor to get granted an audience with the king. So what looked like a paradox was actually the perfect equation for God to move in a miraculous way. So ladies, God wants to redefine the circumstances in which you think are a mess and which you think you were born into that are a disaster, that were trauma, that were an accident. And what if you actually got a viewpoint of how God is orchestrating and using it all for his glory because I don't know about you but I believe it says in his word that he uses all things for his glory he works all things together for the good and it wasn't God who did the genocide but he thought I know my children are gonna need a deliver so I'm gonna get one that's gonna get into the royal courts that's gonna know the custom the education the ways See, Moses didn't understand that he was the perfect person for the moment because all he could see was his failed decisions and his past sins. And God was trying to get him to see beyond himself. And let's read and see what happens. We're coming in at verse 11, Exodus 3. This is a conversation that, ladies, I want you to just suck this for all it's worth. Because to me, this is a conversation that can pull nugget after nugget after nugget out of. It's so relatable to what I believe God wants to say to us tonight. Verse 11, he is having, and let me just say this before I dive into that. There is a burning bush that's not consumed, and the voice of God comes out and begins to prophesy to Moses, saying, I have called you to be a deliverer of the children of Israel, to take them to a land full of milk and honey, which means the abundance of the Lord. He says, tell them I have heard their cries, and I am bringing a deliverer to set them free. So he says, this is a holy ground. Remove your sandals. So can you imagine? This isn't just a story. This actually happened, ladies. Moses is in the desert. There is a bush that is burning that is not consuming. And the voice of God is speaking to you. Yahweh is speaking to you. And he is prophesying. Not an awesome prophet. Not a nice prophetic ministry team member. Very valuable. But Yahweh himself is prophesying over you. And this is how Moses responds. Verse 11, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God responds, I will be with you and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And Moses responds, but who shall I say sent me? And God says, say I am has sent me to you. The Lord of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. This will serve as a memorial to all the generations. Go and gather the elders and tell them, the Lord has appeared to you saying, I've surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. And the Lord will bring the children of Israel out of the affliction of Egypt to a land flowing with milk and honey. Then they will listen to you, Moses. But the king of Egypt will not let them go. So I will strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, the king will not let them go. Excuse me, will let them go. Verse 21. And the children of Israel will have favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be that the children of Israel will not leave empty handed. But they shall have articles of gold. Articles of silver, clothing, and you shall put on your sons and your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. Move to Exodus 4, verse 1. And Moses responds to that. Now let's just take a quick pause. God has laid it all out. Don't you wish he sometimes did that with you? He's like, okay, so let me break it down. Here's how it's going to go. They're going to believe you just say this. Pharaoh won't. Don't worry about it. I got you. I'm going to do some science. It's totally fine. They'll follow you. I'll set them free. You're all going to walk out with like a ton of loot. It's solid. Go. <laughs> Yahweh himself, burning bush, voice, powerful. And this is how Moses responds. Killing me. <laughs> Exodus 4.1. 
But suppose they won't believe me or listen to my voice or believe that you've appeared to me. God responds, Moses, I'm going to give you three signs to show you, to show people that I have sent you. Now let me recap what those signs are for the sake of time. The first sign was when the rod became a serpent. The second sign was when the leprous hand, he stuck his hand into his bosom. He pulls it out. It's white leprous. He says, stick it back in your bosom. He does. He pulls it out a second time, and it's totally healed. So the second sign was healing. The third sign was water turning to blood on the dry land. Why those three signs? What are the significance? What's the significance of those three signs? The first is the rod representing authority. The second is healing the leprous hand. And the third is water turning to blood on the dry land, meaning covenant. So what's God saying? He's saying with the children of Israel, I am sending you to demonstrate I'm the supreme authority that's going to bring healing to my kids and establish my covenant because I rule and I reign. And when my kids cry upon to, to my name, I will deliver them and set the captives free because that's who I am. So those three signs weren't just any signs. They were the mandate of what Moses was bringing to the children of Israel. And in Exodus 4.10, Moses responds, but I'm not eloquent. I'm slow of speech, slow of tongue. And God responds, but who's made the man's mouth? Now go and I'll be with your mouth and teach you what, you, what to say. And here's the clincher. Moses responds, please send someone else. And we've got to read one more verse just so we fully understand what happened. Exodus 4.14, God says, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. So the Lord appointed Aaron to be the spokesman to the people. And Aaron will serve as Moses' mouth, and Moses shall be like God to him. But the Lord allowed Moses to keep the rod as a sign of the authority that the Lord gave Moses. When I read verse 13 of Moses saying, send someone else, I literally put my Bible down and started crying. And I started crying because I saw exactly what was going on here and I saw myself in Moses I saw the same focus on why God couldn't use me that consistently overrode who he is meaning my lack was greater than God's power Every time Moses said no to God, that's exactly what he was saying, ladies. Every time you and I say no to God, we are saying our insecurity, what we view as insufficiency, our quote-unquote lack, our lack of title, education, money, network, you fill in the blank. Whatever your reasoning is, you have just said that thing is greater than Yahweh. That thing is greater than the King of Kings. Here's a possibly disturbing thought, at least it was to me. In God's kindness, he allowed Aaron to be the front person, but allowed Moses to still carry the rod of authority and be the mouthpiece. But it went through a second person that was never intended to go through. But in his mercy, God allowed it. How many times, like Moses, have we built ministries, homes, families, workplaces around our insecurities and because it quote unquote has fruit? And we're still allowed to run it, lead it, do it. We think we have the blessing of the Lord, but we actually are still living in total rebellion and disobedience. Moses' whole leadership structure was built around his dysfunction. Moses' entire leadership and leading and mandate was based around his no, not his yes. Ladies, 
Ladies, are you getting this? God's mercy still allowed him to be used even though the no was louder than the yes. That's the mercy and the grace of God. But let's not get it twisted, ladies. He still walked in a lesser version of what he was created to walk in that was available to him. Because he was saying, God, you can use me, but only in this box, only in these parameters, only in these conditions. That he made God jump through his hoops rather than him trust God. See, God wanted to use his mouth. And what was his response? I'm a stutter, I'm slow of speech. And then God said, but who made the man's mouth? I'm not a theologian. I, maybe one day I will be. But I don't know if theologians would argue with me just studying scripture through the years and just knowing the character of God. Scripturally, that feels like when God said, who made the man's mouth? Doesn't that feel like an invitation for healing? That let's just put it on the table for consideration. That he was saying, Moses, if you trust me with your most insecure place, if you trust me in your most vulnerable place, Come on, ladies, you catch it. And the place where you're like, God, oh, you can have everything, oh, but not that. Don't ask me that. God's like, that's exactly what I want because it's the one thing you don't trust me with. And if I, if I'm going to be Lord of your life, you've got to trust me with all of who you are. Because, ladies, this isn't a compartmentalization walk with Jesus. This is not a copy and paste Christianity. This is a full surrendered, completely no holds bar, all chips in. You got it all. I'm totally abandoned. I lay it all out for you. God, you have it all. Relationship with the King of Kings. And see, God, in his mercy, kept going after that same root in Moses' life. What are the areas in your life where you're like, oh, yeah, I'll do, I'll do that, sure. No problem, I'll do that. Not that. Tonight, I want you to remove the word no out of your relationship with Jesus. Because tonight is about contrast. And ladies, contrast is created in the abandonment. Contrast is created, and this is a word, I'll catch this, I just feel Holy Spirit on it. Contrast is created in the surrender. Contrast is created in the surrender. Here's the thing. I read you Exodus 3. We just went through that pivotal conversation between God and Moses. And if we skip ahead, which I want you to in your Bibles, turn to Numbers 20. This is at the end of Moses' life. I want you to understand kind of the middle. We talked about the beginning of his life. It kind of inserted a key conversation that was a destiny conversation. And now we're popping to the end of his life. The children of Israel have had a tough time in the wilderness, to say the least. They're there a lot longer than they expected to be. It's been difficult. They're hungry. They're thirsty. The circumstances are very trying. And if anyone has maybe been a mom, a pastor, a leader, a co-worker, any role in your life, you'll be able to relate. When people complain and you don't have a solution, it can be incredibly aggravating. Moses and Aaron were no different. They had people complaining to them, we're hungry, we're tired, and they begin saying crazy things as people do when they're frustrated and irritated and angry. We should have just stayed back in captivity. Why the heck did you take us out to the wilderness? We were better there, which they weren't. But in their crazy state of frustration, they said crazy things. Moses and Aaron are just over it. 
And they're so frustrated because they've been here before and the children of Israel are ungrateful because God has been so miraculous and it feels like it's still not enough. So Moses and Aaron go to the presence of the Lord and they said, Lord, what do we do? Yahweh, what do we do? And the Lord says to Moses, I want us to read it, Numbers 20, verse 10. He says, excuse me, let me just add this one thing. Moses gives us, excuse me, the Lord gives Moses a strategy when they come into the presence of the Lord. He says, Moses, I want you to speak to the rock and water will flow. What's God going after once again? His mouth. What's the one area that God went after Moses at the beginning of his call? His mouth. It's the same root that God is going after. Because it hasn't been dealt with. And God in his mercy knows what's right around the corner. So God, being the infinite God, seeing where this is going and knowing how pivotal and this decision is for Moses. In his mercy, not his wrath, his mercy, he comes once again and he says, come on, Moses. Speak to the rock. But you see, this had happened before. And God had allowed Moses to use the rod of authority to to strike the rock. He didn't require him to speak. He allowed him to still be in his little box of no. But we were about to step into the promised land at this moment. So this wasn't a wilderness moment, ladies. We can't act like we're still in the wilderness. We're about to step into the promised land because what worked in the wilderness isn't going to work in the promised land. So he allowed Moses to use the rod to stay in his little box of no in the wilderness. But because there was a transition in the spirit... Moses was invited to step over into the transition to trust God in his most vulnerable place. Are you catching this? And how does Moses respond? Numbers 20.10, Moses says, Hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and every one and their animals drank. In the initial conversation between Moses and God that we read, all of Moses' responses were, what will I sound like? Who will believe me? What will I look like? I can't talk. I'm slow of speech. It was all about him. It was all about what he looked like, sounded like, his reputation, his ego, what everyone else would think of him, man-pleasing. Ego, man-pleasing. What's the stronghold? What's the root of that? Pride. That's a stronghold of pride because, I want you to catch this, the stronghold of pride was never fully uprooted in his life. He built his entire, I want you to catch this, he built his entire ministry around a spirit of pride. And he went through the wilderness leading from a spirit of pride. And in the transition from wilderness to promised land, God was saying, in order to go to the promised land, that pride can't come over here. That pride has to be uprooted and demolished. And because Moses had a pattern of disobedience, and had become casual in his reverence and obedience to God. 
and he had allowed no to become commonplace. It was so normal to say no, it was more normal to say no than yes. So in the pivotal moment, he did not understand the significance of that decision. But because the stronghold of pride had never been uprooted, it was still active and given permission to rule and reign. It was still the spirit that was operating at that moment through his life. Because the invitation to touch his mouth, the most vulnerable place, had been denied once again. As soon as he said no, in God's mercy once again, God still gave water but Moses then had to pass it to Joshua and was not allowed to go to the promised land. Ladies, what am, where am I going? Because there is a transition in the spirit tonight. And how we've been operating in the wilderness, maybe even the mountaintops. It is not business as usual anymore. I want you to catch this because I'm not just doing a sermon tonight. I'm giving you prophetic strategy from heaven right now. If you grab a hold of this for some of you, it's going to change the course of your life. Because there is an invitation to trust God and have cycles that have, you have built your life around that are totally ungodly and dysfunctional. And I'm not questioning your heart and I'm not questioning your salvation. Please do not hear that. Moses loved God. He was serving God. He was used by God. But there was clear bondage in his life that ultimately sabotaged him from his destiny. And in God's mercy, we could look at that and go, but he was still used. Yes, he was. But ladies, don't you want it all? If it's available... Don't you want the fullness and for us to stop settling for the subpar version of what we think is okay? And just because, quote, unquote, you've been used in that area, what if there was a greater portion that was available to you? See, tonight is not about hearing this message for anyone else. The default setting in all of us is to hear this and go, you know who needs to hear this word? I am texting her right now. She needs to pop right on. I know. That's all of our default setting. Uh, me too. Me too. But can I kindly ask that we listen tonight for ourselves? You listen tonight, not for the person on your left, your right. Or the person that should have been here that wasn't here. They'll hear it. Don't worry. God's amazing at getting every part that people need. He's beautiful that way. But tonight is about you getting your portion. Tonight is about you dealing with your stuff. Me dealing with my stuff. Because God wants to create a contrast in my surrender. He wants to come create a contrast in your yes. See, God, remember I said, this is a year of breaking cycles. What kind of cycles am I talking about? It might be some big stuff for people tonight that we would classify as bigger stuff. But actually, that's not what I felt like the Lord was focusing on. I felt like the Lord was focusing on the small, silent, subtle, familiar, quiet things that we have identified as our personality, but are actually learned behaviors of undealt with pain and disappointment from past and learned behaviors from trauma that we've actually been taught to be certain ways, but it's actually not our sanctified version of who God's created us to be. I'm talking about cycles. These are some things I heard. Lack of confidentiality. 
have a difficult time keeping things private. Krista, why are you going here? Oh, no, these are the things that sabotage relationship and favor. These are things that people won't trust you. Doors will shut. Influence will deplete. We don't talk about these things in the church. Sometimes we call them prayer chains. I was raised by an intercessor, so don't think I didn't hear her confront a few people on the prayer chain a few times, because I did. She's the sweetest woman you'll ever meet. Comparison. I'm talking about cycles that I felt like I heard the Lord say, I want to break tonight in your life. You think that's normal? No, ladies, that's not normal. That's normal in the world, but we're talking about contrast. The world compares. The kingdom of God celebrates. Because there's room for everyone to be amazing and shine in the kingdom of God. Insecurity. Eating disorders. Self-doubt. These are cycles God wants to break. I'm just going to keep reiterating this. Why are we talking about this? Because these are the quiet, silent, familiar things that feel normal, and they are not normal. They are not your God-given destiny or inheritance. We have learned them. We have embraced them. We have said they are who we are, but they are never intended to be who you are. Gossip. Fear. Oh, Dr. Caroline Leaf did such a beautiful job last night. She said, we were wired to love and we learned to fear. Oh, I I just have to soak on that for a while. She was profound. I mean, she just was profound. Depression. Critical nature. Road rage. (laughs) We live in the Bay. That is real. I don't know about here, but that is very real in California. If you lose your salvation when you are behind the wheel, (laughs) Jesus wants to set you free. (laughs) Because there has to be contrast. And it doesn't just stop on Sunday morning. It also includes your drive home. (laughs) Fits of anger and rage. I'm going to go here for a moment. If people are afraid to make you mad, if people are nervous, let me get a little, can you you trust me to get a little more personal? If your children or your spouse or your family is afraid to make you mad, there's bondage there. No one should ever be afraid to make you mad. Because you and I should never be volatile, out of control. We are filled with the Spirit of God to walk in the Spirit of God and to have the fruit of the Spirit. Which we'll get to that in just a moment. But we have allowed us just to have a moment and said it's okay. And if we have allowed our home, I'm getting personal because ladies, he wants to set you free from anger. And there is a lot of angry women in the church. I pastored for 14 years and I saw so many angry women. And it's time anger gets out of the church. Because if we are angry women, we're going to have angry homes, we're going to have angry children, and we're going to have an angry legacy. No one should ever be afraid of you If things don't go your way, how do you respond? We're getting up close and personal. These are the familiar things that we think are just my personality. I just have a short fuse. No, no, no. Honey, you learned to have a short fuse. That is not the spirit of God in your life. 
That is a learned behavior that God wants to, you to unlearn and set you free from. I love you enough to tell you that God has a higher plan for you than where you've been living. Because if you've been living in a place of anger, you have been living a subpar version of the freedom of Christ that is available to you. We have to talk about these things in the church. Control. I don't know if I even need to say any more. Mm. <laughs> oh, now you make me want to go, girl. We can all relate to this. I know I certainly can. Let's just be honest. I like things done a certain way. I like my way. It's a good way. I like my house to be a certain way. I like my, my husband's nodding very graciously. I'm kidding. I like my house to be a certain way. I like things a certain way. But when you open up your life and you bring people into it, it is not going to be that certain way. So you can choose to have control and be isolated and alone. This is for someone in the room. I just feel Holy Spirit on this. You can be alone and in control. Or you can open up your life and it's a little messy. It's unpredictable. But it's rich and it's deep and it's worth it but you're required to let go of control. Suspiciousness. I know, odd. But there's a lot of suspicious people. I don't trust their motive. I don't trust them totally. No one may know you even think this way. This is so familiar and so a part of your mentality, you are sizing people up and down and assessing them whether they are trustworthy or not before you even give them a chance to open up their mouth. That is not a godly belief system. Yes, there is wisdom, but not suspiciousness, where we are questioning motives and character. There is a difference between the two. A victim mentality. You cannot be victorious if you're living from a victim mentality. And you and I are called to be victorious. We are called to be more than conquerors. What does a victim mentality sound like, Krista? It sounds like that. Of course that just happened. That always happens to me. This always happens to me. And you lead out with your traumas, your pains, and your disillusionment, and your disappointments, your closest relationships may be possibly based on trauma rather than freedom. Because misery loves company. So if your closest relationships are based off your trauma, I don't know. Can I just put it on the table for consideration? I don't know if that's the healthiest relationship for you. Can you just consider that? Because I see women that are dealing with the same broken issues and they like migrate. And I'm thinking, honey, that's the last thing you need. You need to get out of that group into a group of women that are walking in the exact opposite of where you are at. Get away from the misery and get into the freedom. Come on. Freedom. It might be your natural desire because you're connecting. But ladies, you need to get beyond connecting and get into freedom. I know we want to be understood, but don't worry. Friend, I'm serious, and I'm not minimizing pain trauma. It is real, and life has very difficult circumstances and very traumatic situations at times. I am not minimizing pain. But I am saying we serve a God that is bigger than any trauma and pain that you have ever been to. And it is time we allow God to be the transforming God that he is and let his transformation power be truly manifested 
in our lives. Pride, we talked about that. Unteachable. Anyone speaks into your life. You may not like the package. I had schools of ministry, oh my. The stories, the stories they gave me. You may not like the package it comes in. I'm not even saying the package in which feedback, constructive feedback comes in sometimes is maybe the best package. It may have been a horrible package. There may be accuracy to that. However, what if, what if, what they were saying had some truth in it? We have to be open to people speaking into our lives. I am speaking from this man my parents, my best friends, my accountability partners, my spiritual mom and dad. I have a plethora of people that have full freedom to speak into my life at any time. And they have spoken hard things that are difficult to hear. But when I know they have my best interests in mind, I am a fool if I do not listen to the wisdom of those around me. And we want to mature in our walk with God, but we don't want the feedback for the process. <laughs> Ladies, we serve the most humble king. Where is our humility? Yes. Where, where along the way did we learn that only certain people get to speak into our lives? I'm not saying everything that's ever been said to us is accurate. Of course not. There's wisdom and balance in what I'm saying. Hear that. But we have to be open. Yes, thank you. I'm, you're, you're, go, you're traveling with me. I like this. She's, go, she's with me. We have to be open to people speaking to our blind spots because every one of us have them. We have patterns, defaults, tendencies. God, if you allow him, key word, if you allow him, he will put beautiful people in your life that will serve as safeguards and parameters to protect you and guard you. And it won't always be fun or easy, but it will protect you and save you from so much baggage and bondage if you allow truth to be spoken into your life. Easily offended. I just have a couple more. She didn't invite me. I can't believe they posted that on social media and I wasn't invited. I thought they were my friends. They didn't even compliment my cute outfit. Or maybe it's something much more serious. Maybe you would be justified, quote unquote, in that offense. Maybe you have all the rights to be totally offended in the world. But we don't serve the world. We serve the king of kings who had the greatest offenses against him and on the cross, bloodied, bruised, and broken. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they've done. The most unoffendable heart, that's who we serve, and yet we get offended if someone didn't say hi to us. Come on, ladies. Come on. We've got to go Isaiah 55 right now. His ways are not our ways. His ways are higher. His ways are higher. Come on, ladies. I'm calling you higher tonight. Get out of the ground battle and go higher with the presence of God. Come on, we're going higher tonight. We have been stuck in ruts and ditches and graves and bondage. And tonight he's saying, I'm taking off the grave clothes. I'm setting the captive free. Come on, get out of the place of bondage and get into your freedom. That is what is available to every one of us 
24 hours a day, seven days a week, every single moment of your life, you have the creator of all of heavens dwelling within you. You feel overwhelmed by the enemy, you call on the name of Jesus. You need a healer, you call on the great physician. You need transformation, you call on the redeemer because that's who he is. Anytime you need anything, you call on one of the names of God and he has every answer, ladies, that you've ever needed. Last one, and I'm going here, moodiness. I know that once a month we think we are entitled. I'm going to say this, baby, and I hope I don't embarrass you, but as a menstruating woman, we do not have the right. I'm serious. It may feel like you have the hormonal right every month, and it's real. The struggle is real, but ladies, so is Jesus. Ladies, I'm serious. He is bigger than your PMS. He is bigger than your hormones. And I'm not saying that's not real. It is very real. It is. But ladies, we are responsible for our thoughts, feelings, actions, behaviors, and attitudes. We are responsible at all times. Now, I know I'm kind of playing and kidding around about moodiness. And I'm joking around about hormones and what. And that's real. But let's just talk about moodiness in general. Anything doesn't go your way. I don't like the way my husband just said that. I withdraw my affection. Oh, did I just go there? There's some mar there's a marital discussion happening right now. But isn't that our natural default? Let's just be honest. Someone does something we don't like, what do we do? We withdraw affection. What if Jesus responded to us that way? We did something Jesus didn't like. Where are, where, where are you, Jesus? He's like, I'm not feeling you right now. I don't like the way you just prayed. It was kind of about you. So I'm like going to let you have party of one. And I'll be back a little later. Jesus is not moody. Moodiness is connected with offense. I don't know if we've ever talked about that in the church, but let's just go and talk about that. When you're easily offended, you're easily moody. You're put out, you're irritated, you're frustrated, you're angry, you're rubbed the wrong way, we're too sensitive, whatever it is. No one has authority over your thoughts, feelings, actions, behaviors, or your moods unless you give them the authority. No one can make you angry. Your husband, your spouse, your children, cannot make you anything. Your husband, your coworker, your boss, your children, whomever, insert the blank. Anyone, the road rager, the person that's super rude to you at the supermarket, whomever it is, just fill in the blank. The mother-in-law, the father-in-law, the sister-in-law, let's go there. No one can make you any, feel any emotion negative unless you allow them to have that authority or influence into your life. Ladies, we have been handing over our authority to people that don't deserve it, shouldn't have it, and we're never intended to take it. We've got to take that back and own our emotional state. And if you find yourself moody, where you just kind of, uh, just irritated, people put you out really quick. 
God wants to set you free. We're talking about cycles that God wants to break. Remember, we're talking about the quiet, silent things that are familiar, that may seem like your personality, but are not your personality. They're learned behaviors, passed down things. Are you catching? Moses had no idea this was bondage. He just thought it was who he was. Here's some statements I heard the Lord say. I just want to read them over you. Or how about when we live from a place where we're trying to earn and prove our value to ourselves and to God? He wants to break that in your life. Or maybe when you're striving for someone's acceptance, even to the detriment of your own well-being. God wants to break that in your life. When we're so determined to not repeat the sins of our family line or even our past, we live a life full of striving and perfectionism. God wants to break that cycle tonight. Or maybe you live in such fear of failing that you have this need to have control instead of letting God have control. And God wants to set you free from control and manipulation. Or maybe you live from such an intense level of comparison to those around you that by your standards, you're always coming up short. And you are so hard on yourself, you've never actually celebrated the fact that you are created in the image of the God, the Father, your Father. You're so critical of yourself, you've never even celebrated yourself. God wants to deliver you from a spirit of self-hatred. Maybe you're so determined to not be taken advantage of that if anyone in your life does anything that resembles betrayal or disloyalty, you cut them out of your life so fast before you even give them a chance to explain themselves or make it right. You have a zero margin for error in relationships. And because of that, and because we're all imperfect people, you find yourself in a consistent pattern of close relationships in your life falling apart. God wants to deliver you today. The way you speak to your children, the way you speak to your spouse, the way you respond in conflict or frustrated circumstances. Galatians 5, you don't have to turn there, I'm just going to read it over you. Galatians 5, 22, 23 says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and the whammy, self-control. One more time. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Ladies, that's our mandate. That's our inheritance. That's our God-given covenant. That's our promise of the Spirit of God. That's what needs to be coming out of us, not the other junk. Remember, we're after contrast tonight. There has to be a difference in this time in history because we're in a transition in the spirit. We've been in a little bit of a wilderness season in this nation, and it still might look like we are, but I want to tell you, honey, we are no longer in the wilderness season. We're about to step into a major move of God in this nation. Because revival is going to break out in America. I promise you, we are going to see a greater harvest than we've ever seen. But God is saying, I need my daughters healthy because there's an assignment at hand and I need them healed and healthy and whole. I need them to walk in the full version of who they have been created to be because I have big plans for them. God said an interesting thing to me. I want to just kind of share this. It's certainly not an exhaustive list at all. But he just kind of dropped this in my spirit. And I just went, oh, my goodness. He said, Krista, there is sanctified and unsanctified versions of your personality, of all of our personalities. And connecting to kind of what we talked about with Moses, he had a justice call, but it wasn't discipled. There was an unsanctified version of it. It's called vengeance. The God version, the sanctified version, is called justice. The unsanctified version is vengeance. But they actually start in the same root. They just have different branches of what's feeding 
the soil. So just go with me here. These are just some things I heard the Lord say about sanctified and unsanctified versions of personalities. Mercy versus codependency. What if you're living in codependency, but you've actually been called to a mercy gift, but because it's undiscipled, it's actually been a detriment to you, but it was always supposed to be a blessing to you, but because it's been enabling dysfunction, you've never walked in the full version of it. Leader versus dictator. Sanctified, unsanctified. Excellence versus perfectionism. Sanctified. They're so similar. I mean, they're like this. They're just so similar. But they're very different end results. Right? Very different motives. Free spirit versus unreliable. I'm an artist. I minored in art at my university. I'm creative. I know the creative people get a really bad rap for being unreliable. And I remember that kind of understanding that that was kind of the impression that people had of creative people. And I just heard the Lord say, no, you're going to break that mold. You're going to break that stereotype. You can be totally creative and a free spirit. And my husband will testify, I am a total free spirit. I'm like, What's, what should we do today? And my husband's like, got this awesome regiment. He's like the most disciplined person you've ever met. He definitely has a very spontaneous side, though. So I want to paint an accurate picture. But I'm like, I don't know, is that what we feel like doing? That's very me. <laughs> but we can be reliable. We can be dependable. And yet be a free spirit. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. It's a simple principle. But we ignore it. And if we ignore it, it's going to rot. This is for someone in the house. Your yes has to be yes and your no has to be no because if it's not, it will sabotage the influence and the favor you've been given because if they can't trust you and you're not reliable, they will remove the favor from you. If someone grabs a hold of that in the house, that's going to change your life. You said, that's just the way I am. No, no, honey. That's what you've learned and you've gotten away with. Just like Moses, he got away with stuff, but we're in a transition in the spirit and what has worked in the previous season isn't going to work in the promised land. And tonight we're going to the promised land for you, for your destiny, for your mandate. Pure versus legalistic or self-righteous. Administrative versus bossy. I'll just let you sit on that. <laughs> Introvert. We have introverts and extroverts. Introverts. Aloof. Introvert versus aloof. You can be quiet and reserved and still available for relationships, still accessible and warm. That doesn't mean you have to be loud, demonstrative, and all over the place in the sanguine. You can be quiet, reserved, and not many words but you can be available and open for relationship and warm and friendly when people come and approach you. See, there's, there's a difference. Sanctified, unsanctified. Extrovert versus overbearing. I'm an extrovert, clearly. <laughs> Just because there's a vacancy in leadership or an open mic does not mean I have to grab it. I will say that again, and for everyone's toes, I will talk about myself. But remember, if this applies to you, please apply it. If there is a leadership vacancy, or there is a moment to be shared, or a mic to be grabbed, extroverts, that doesn't mean it's about you. Sometimes, what if we used our extrovert personalities to pull out the gold in those around us, and we didn't make it about us? Right, because us extroverts, we can kind of, not intentionally, but it can be about us. We've made it about us. And God's like, what about using your personality for my glory to call out other people? Are you getting the gist of tonight? Thanks for trusting me. I just feel led to say that. I know I'm going in deep. First time, 
you've heard me and you're kind of like, whoa, girl. <laughs> I promise you it's because I'm so radically in love with you, Tr truly. Like, I love you because you're my sisters and because I feel the heart of the Lord over my sisters. And I heard the Lord say, I want you to begin to preach this word to the women of this nation. Because I'm calling the women of America, and actually truth is, he's calling the women all over the world. Because it's time for women to rise up. But it's so essential that we're walking in our freedom. And we're walking in the God version of who we are called to be. So how do we break cycles? The pastoral side of me kicks in. I gotta I got give you a little bit of just practical strategy. I'm gonna ask someone to come to the keys because we're gonna get ready to flow and minister. We're gonna open up altars. I know it's a little late, but friends, we only get to do this once a year. Is that okay? Can we go for it a little bit? Because I know movies are getting longer and church services are getting shorter because my husband always says that and I love it and I just borrowed it because it's so good. But it's true, movies are getting longer, church services are getting shorter, and I'm not saying length determines how awesome a service is, but can we just say, God, we're gonna stay here tonight. Don't worry, I'm, I have no plans of keeping you in crazy hours, but I do want you to be positioned of your heart, just saying, whatever it takes for me to touch the hem of the garment tonight. Whatever it takes for there to be that cycle broken, God, tonight I choose you. Whatever it looks like, I'm not leaving this altar. I'm not leaving this seat. I'm not leaving this building until I encounter the fullness of who you are because done are the days where I'm going to live in the subpart version of who you've called me to be. Because blinders just got ripped off tonight. Blind spots just got exposed tonight. Tonight you got to own it. Tonight, you got to own something. It can't be broken if you don't acknowledge it and own it. I'm going to say that again. It can't get broken unless you acknowledge it, friends, and own it. I say, God, forgive me. Beautiful process called repentance. That the world... And maybe even the church has made kind of a religious act. Oh, friends, it's the farthest thing from religious. It's such an honor to be able to go to him and lay down my shortcomings and my sins and walk away free. What's more beautiful than that? You got to own it. You got to get honest. Come on, ladies. Let's, let's not have one more day of the dysfunction in our lives. Just, let's just draw a line in the spirit and we say, from this day forward, I'm walking out my freedom. Not saying it's going to be perfect, but I am saying God is with you every step of the way, orchestrating that process. You have to break agreement with this thing in your life, with your own mouth. These altar workers, which at some point we're going to go there, they can pray for you, but ladies, there's no greater authority than winning your battle than within your own mouth. When I would lead people through deliverance, it wasn't me praying for them. It was me having them repeat it with their own mouth what to say because I can't get you free, but the Spirit of God is going to set you free. And as you declare it and you profess it and you prophesy over yourself, that's where the transformation, because you've agreed with it, you have to break it. You're getting your voice back tonight. You're getting your fight back tonight. Oh, and I have a word for you tomorrow. So if I freaked you out a little bit tonight, please come back tomorrow. <laughs> I will not be less intense. But I love you enough to go for it. You have to own it. You have to break agreement. The enemy can only access where there is agreement. You break agreement, you close the access. Ask for forgiveness. Invite Jesus into your process. 
then bring someone that is more mature, walking in freedom in the area you need deliverance in. Don't choose your misery partner. Choose the woman that's walking in freedom. Then you go, I, I need what she has. Choose that woman. And even if it's from afar or it's however it looks, get people into your life that are speaking into your life, that are discipling you. We were never created to be islands, ladies. It might be more comfortable. It might be more your natural zone or your default. It might be more what you like. But ladies, you and I have to have relationships. Because everything Jesus did, everything Father God did was out of love relationship. You and I called to have this beautiful example of that relationship with one another. Don't rob yourself from the joy of true friendship and accountability. That might sound scary. When it's Christ-centered, it's beautiful. When you are known, friends, this is for someone, when you are known, even in your brokenness and you're still loved, I want to tell you the freedom that comes in that. Because you're not loved for your perfect perfection. You're loved simply because of who you are. So when you allow people into your life and you stop compartmentalizing, and you tell this person one thing and this person another, but no one actually knows the full version of who you are, stop that. Allow mature women, mothers, sisters of God to know the full version of who you are. Because that is the only way you're going to fully mature in your walk with God. Lastly, and it goes with what I just said, have accountability and get feedback. I know. That can sound scary. No, God, send someone else. Striking the rock, missing out on the promise, missing out on the destiny, that's way more scary. Are you catching me? Denying God's fullness is much more sobering thought than being vulnerable and accountable and honest in my process, in my life. You feeling me? Let's get heaven's perspective tonight. Let's let go of our ego. Let's get humble before the King of Kings.